Washington fumbled again, and we're not talking about number 45. We're talking busted brackets. Tony Romo, Brock Osweiler, Marshawn Lynch, the Giants, and the Jets. And stick around to hear who's on the bench this week. All that and more on What's the 411 Sports coming right up. I'm alive. Welcome to this week's edition of What's the 411 Sports. I'm Keisha Wilson. I'm Mike McDonald. Mike, it's good to see you. How's everything? Going well. Good. You know, Mike, Tom Brady is probably be a very happy man as his Super Bowl jersey has been found. Me, I'm not doing that well because my March Madness turned into March Sadness as my beloved Duke Blue Devils failed to make the Sweet 16 by losing to South Carolina in the tournament. It just looked like the lack of defense that we've shown over the, the course of the season ca- caught up to us and we lost. So I, I'm really sad. Tough loss. They had a <laughs> seven point lead at the half and then they wound up losing by seven points in the game. Tough year for Duke. You know, this is a team, Keisha, you're a big fan, so you know, you know that they were the favorites to go ahead and yeah. win the whole thing. Uh, tough loss, but let's face it. When you have five championships like Mike Krzyzewski, you know that they're going to be able to bounce back and be right in the hunt once again next season. Yeah, I was hoping for number six. What What do you think about the tournament so far? Any upsets, feel-good stories? Nothing completely crazy out of left field. No huge upsets. There have been, now I get it, Villanova, Louisville, Duke. These are all teams that we all expected to go on quality runs here. Villanova, of course, I had them going all the way to the final game. But for the most part, I think that the, a lot, you know, that it's been evenly matched. Even from the two against fifteen teams, you see a lot of, you know, some of these games are a lot tighter than I expected coming into the tournament. I picked one of the the fifteen uh, two upsets. Go me! Um, but I, there was another. There was a couple of feel good stories in the tournament. One will stick with the Duke theme and Chris Collins, who is the head coach of Northwestern. They made it to the NCAA tournament for the first time. They won their first game in school history in the NCAA tournament. They were on the verge of possibly winning another one, but the game ended in a little bit of controversy. And then there's the Michigan basketball team who had their plane skid off the runway when they were on their way traveling to the tournament. They played the following day in their practice jerseys, and they've managed to uh, get a couple wins so far. So it's good. I like, I love this time. My brackets don't, but. <laughs> <laughs> so we're going to move from the sport where the athletes get paid zero dollars to where they get a lot of money. And we're going to go to our nation's capital in Washington, D.C. There's some rumblings going on there, not by the current administration in the White House, but by the Washington, D.C. football franchise. Mike, this franchise is a hot mess to say the very least. They have bumbled the contract situation with their quarterback, Kirk Cousins. They've lost some key players to free agency. And then just to top it off, they fired their general manager, Scott McClellan. Now, the firing is not a big deal in a sense because people lose their jobs all the time in the NFL. But instead of just letting McClellan go on his merry way, the Washington franchise decided they were just going to throw some dirt on his name on his way out. Mike, what do you think is going to be the fallout, if any, from what's been going on so far? One of the fallouts that could happen from this debacle that's happened in the nation's capital is that team players aren't going to want to go play for the Redskins. When they realize that this is the way that the organization is run from top to bottom, that's not a place where people are actually going to want to go play. Now, a couple things that the Redskins do have that have been going in their favor is, well, for one, Jay Gruden has come in there the last couple of years, and he's done a terrific job as the head coach of this team, despite some of the problems that they have. They just missed the playoffs this past season, and they wound up making the playoffs in 2015. The other thing that I will say is that we don't know what the future holds for Kirk Cousins, but at least they do have a quarterback, a quarterback that's won some games for them, a quarterback that's taken them to the playoffs. We're going to talk about some teams today that have horrible quarterback situations. So for the Redskins, while things have gotten very bleak for them at this moment, they're still competing. They still have a quarterback. They still have a coach who's done a very good job. And aside from the fact that Daniel Schneider has not done a good job as the owner of this franchise for the time that he's been there, which is now coming up on 20 years, uh, things can improve for this franchise. Yeah, I think you mentioned the players not wanting to come play for the Washington. What about people in the front office? What general manager is going to step into this this situation? Because by all accounts, you mentioned the record that the uh, the team had under Scott McLuhan, and 
while he wasn't spectacular, it wasn't like they went on a Super Bowl run. They weren't horrible. They made the playoffs they, one year. They just missed it last year. And during that time, you never heard anything negative about him and his job performance coming from um, senior management. And all of a sudden, while he's on his way out, you're going to talk about how he just showed up to work drunk all the time. And it was one source said it was a disaster for 18 months. Well, if that was the case, why did you wait 18 months to fire him? Scott McLuhan had been very open about his previous issues with alcohol. Did they offer him any help? I heard that maybe they, di they did, but it was refused. But I just feel as though that's just bad karma. You, you don't, uh, it, they're affecting possibly his opportunity, McLuhan's opportunity to feed his family by, you know, say, putting dirt on his name. And one thing that is certain, I would say, is that the Washington Redskins w w paid a lot of money for Kirk Cousins and really put themselves in a predicament when they didn't have to. They should have just either got rid of him and in, instead of just loving the one you're with, instead of going out and get the one that you really want for a long-term solution. And then also they extended J Jay Gruden's contract, but, you know, when... The GMs usually like to have their guy. So, you know, it's just a whole debacle. I don't even know what to make of it. I think they're going to be in the bottom of the, the East, NFC East. And that's fine because the Giants will be at the top. <laughs> <laughs> the average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. <laughs> so, going from one franchise whose quarterback is disgruntled. We move to another franchise where their one of their quarterbacks seems to be in kind of a football purgatory. So we're going to have this week's Romo watch. So it's been reported that Tony Romo would either leave the Cowboys via trade or be released. And you know, they, initially they thought he was going to be released, but the Cowboys seem to be holding on to him for trade value. We are coming up here, and he's still with the Cowboys, there's really no talks of trading for him. What do you think is going to happen with Romo? There's rumblings that he will be released in April, which is right around the corner. What do you think of this whole situation, where he might go? What would you do? Yeah, we've been talking about this some, for some time now, about the Tony Romo situation, which, let's face it, it's the biggest story in NFL free agency, no matter what, hands down. Not just because it's the Cowboys, but also because Tony Romo has been a perennial Pro Bowl quarterback coming up now in 15 years. Uh, as far as what the future holds for Tony Romo, I'll, I'll say this, and I never thought this is something that I would say. I'm starting to feel bad for this guy because I think that there's a lot of uncertainty about what's going to happen to him. And he's 36 years old. He's coming into the twilight of his career. What I think is going to happen with Tony Romo is I think he's going to wind up with the Houston Texans. That's my gut feeling. I just think that somehow, some way, he's going to wind up there. I think it would be a good fit. We'll probably talk about that later on in the show because I know that the Texans are one of our topics coming up later. Um, but that's what I think he should. That's what I think for me, for my gut instinct, I think that Tony Romo is going to wind up with Houston. Yeah, I, I think so. I think that's obviously the best fit for him. I just find it interesting that he's still – with the Cowboys, and there was an idea that Jerry Jones was going to do right by Tony Romo and make the situation so that he can go, he being Romo, can go to a situation where he could be happy and compete for a Super Bowl, which is what he wanted to do. But by holding on to him or keeping him in this will we or won't he stage, it's kind of to the detriment of Romo because this is the free agency time where people are starting to wheel and deal and filling gaps. And some of the teams, like the Broncos and the Texans, have gaps to fill and need to know, you know, how much money they have to spend if, you know, given that they may want to acquire Romo. So I, I think that, you know, April's around the corner, so hopefully in the first week of April we will learn something. But wouldn't it be something that this all comes down to them just keeping Tony Romo, because I'm convinced that Tony Romo must be Jerry Jones' adopted son or something, because he just cannot seem to let this man go. And, and so wouldn't it be just some, all this hype, and he just stays? I would not want to see that. Of course, now, I, again, then that's another situation where I would feel bad for Tony Romo because he has an opportunity now coming into the last couple of years of his career. This could he could, do, he could wind up signing with Denver or with Houston, go to one of these teams, and then just get hurt in the first week of the season and his career is, is, is completely over. 
for now, we don't know what the future holds, so it's only time will tell what's going to happen. Yeah. Well, right. stick with us because we've got so much more to talk about. Football, basketball, and baseball all coming up. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision-making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Brock Osweiler is now a quarterback for the Cleveland Browns, but maybe not for long as it's been rumored that the Browns may cut him. By sending Osweiler to the Browns, the Texans saved $16 million in cash, $10 million in cap space, cutching, and they received a fourth round compensatory pick uh, in 2017. On the other hand, the Browns got Osweiler, and a 2017 sixth round pick and a second round 2018 pick. Mike, what do you think these respective teams are planning given these moves that they made? I think it's a good move for both parties. I'll start with the Houston Texans. I think Brock Osweiler had to be moved. There was a situation that happened with the Houston Texans. Uh, I think it was during the last regular season game of the season where Osweiler wasn't playing in the game. They put him back in the game. He had a temper tantrum in the locker room. And then it was caused a huge rift with Bill O'Brien, the head coach. And they had to get rid of the guy. And he wasn't going to be a part of their future. They realized this. I think for the Houston Texans, as I mentioned earlier, this is going to give them an opportunity to go ahead and look for the possible fit with Tony Romo. And if Tony Romo doesn't work out, they might have to be. They maybe they can trade up in the draft or make an upgrade at the quarterback position with with another option to, by doing it that way. As far as the Cleveland Browns are concerned, I think what this might give them an opportunity to do is just like I said with Houston, they can trade up if they need to. I know that they have that number one pick, but I can't see them using that on a quarterback. But there are some good quarterbacks that are available in this upcoming NFL draft, and I could certainly see the Cleveland Browns going and electing to draft a quarterback coming up in the draft, and that way they would fix their problems. I don't think Brock Osweiler has any future at all in the NFL. He was definitely overpaid for eight games. I mean, I think he has ability. I mean, he has an arm. A cannon for an arm, uh, and he he's tall. He can move a little bit, so I think there might be something there. It's just not right now as a starting quarterback. So as you had mentioned, I think the moves that Texas made made opened the door wider for Tony Romo to step back in. If not Tony Romo, maybe another mid-level type veteran quarterback. Ryan Fitzpatrick's name had been bantered about. The Cleveland Browns stockpiling picks. They got the number one overall. They have 11 picks in this upcoming draft, so they can use them to draft players because, quite frankly, no one's itching to go to Cleveland. Or they can use it in, you know, trade talks. Well, Keisha, we shift to the hardwood. We talk about the NBA and this resting players controversy that's really holding back the NBA regular season. Recently, Keisha, the Warriors rested their stars for a nationally televised game against the Spurs. Following that game, the Cavaliers rested their big three players against the Clippers. Keisha, I ask you, does the NBA have to address teams benching their star players during games that the networks are paying for? And also, if this is the case, should fans be reimbursed for the tickets that they're spending money on when they don't get to see the show that they asked for? Yeah, um, Adam, Commissioner Adam St Silver, I almost said Adam Stern, a com combination of Adam Silver and David Stern, the previous commissioner, Adam Silver uh, did send a memo to the owners addressing this issue and imploring them to be involved in the decision making because from a business standpoint, which the NBA is, it's a business, it's not good for the stars of respective teams not to play on televised games. There's a lot of advertising dollars that go into this and you don't want to tick off your business partners when by making them feel like they're not getting what a return on their investment because I tell you what I li I watch ESPN a lot and they they hype up these games that little John turned down for LeBron James and turned down for Steph Curry you know you it's drawing you in to see those players and so when they don't show up to play it's disappointing uh, on the business end and as a as a fan it is because I know that when I'm looking for tickets I'm looking for some of those key matchups you know I don't live in Cleveland I don't really visit Cleveland don't have any but when LeBron comes to town I'm taking notice oh well let me see how much you know the tickets are and I think that the fans should get some sort of reimbursement I don't know if a full refund I mean I don't know how the mechanics would work on that because that seems to be a lot of manpower 
but I think that maybe at minimum they should the fans should receive a, a, a refund in terms of the rate differential because ticket prices vary depending on who the opponents are. You know, we're local here in New York, so when for the Knicks and the Nets, when Cleveland comes to town, when Golden State comes to town, OKC comes to town, uh, Miami Heat wins, we, we, those, price, those ticket prices shoot right up. And why? Because you want to see LeBron, you want to see Steph, you want to see Russell Westbrook, you want to see Dwayne Wade. And if they're not there, then, well, hey, I'm paying for what I'm not getting. So I feel as though at minimum they should get the differential in price back. Yeah, I think absolutely. Fans should definitely be reimbursed. If they're paying, spending money on tickets, as you said, when the prices are going to go up, right, they're charging more money for the Cavalier game than mm-hmm. they are for the Brooklyn Net game. Yeah. So, and the other thing that bothers me here is they're not doing this on the ro- on, at home. They're all doing it when they go on the road. They're, yeah. not, they're not, you know, um, hurting their hometown fans. One of the ways that the NBA says that they can fix this is by starting the season a little bit earlier, where you play the 82-game schedule. Maybe you start a week or two uh, earlier in September. Maybe you start the season in, in mid-September or, or in earlier October. Yeah. You can't start the season in September, <laughs> so it'll have to be in mid- mid-October. But, uh, yeah, this is a problem that the NBA certainly is going to have to face. But I like the fact that Adam Silver has addressed this and, and that going forward, hopefully it's not going to be hurting fans like us right. who want to watch good regular season <laughs> matchups. Yeah, and it's, it's kind of crazy, and I'll, I'll end on this, that you know you have a lot of the old school players coming out talking about why are you even resting? Carl Malone and said you should have a minimum 10 years before you even think about resting. And, when I, and that sparked me to remember uh, way back when, Michael Jordan barely took any rest. He, you know, and Kobe Bryant and all this stuff, so... The NBA's got uh, some work to do in the offseason, so. Well, stick with us because it's game time, and coming up, we're putting Keisha on the hot seat. My new dad teaches me all kinds of stuff. I wouldn't use this one. He helps me with my decision-making. Ever. And he's even teaching me how to drive. And that's why cars have bumpers. You don't have to be perfect to be a perfect parent. Thousands of kids in foster care will take you just as you are. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Okay, Keisha, it's game time. We'll start with the first question. Draymond Green recently said that he is a du- he is a victim of a double standard when it comes to officiating in the NBA. Valid or nonsense? I mean, I think it could be valid, but it's from his own doing. You can't go around kicking people in the ding ding. You can't, you know, be screaming every time you get called for a foul and get all these technicals and not think that's going to catch up with you. I'm pretty certain that referees are already predisposed to his behavior and will not tolerate it and may be quicker to fa- uh, call a tee on him or maybe a foul, but it's of his own doing if, it, if he is a victim of it. Right, it's almost like he's a victim of his own personality, <laughs> yeah. right? So it's not like he's a, it's a double or double standard or anything. I completely agree with you. Okay, uh, last question, Keisha, is quarterback Robert Griffin III was released by the Cleveland Browns. Does he have any future at all in the NFL? He does, but not as a starting quarterback. I think the biggest thing about him is his availability and what do we say in the NFL or maybe in sports in general the best availability no the best ability is availability if you can't stay on that that field nobody's really going to want you and then when he has taken the field it's not like he's knocked anybody's socks off so I think that his future is bleak (laughs) right either as a backup quarterback or he's gonna have to go up north to Canada so we'll stick with us because coming up is our New York sports report Traditional light bulbs actually generate nine times more heat than light. Switch to energy-saving bulbs. Saving energy saves you money. Welcome back to What's the 401 Sports. Mike, the New York Giants and Jets have been wheeling and dealing during the free agency period. So let's talk about some of the moves the Giants made. The Giants signed former Jets wide receiver Brandon Marshall to a two-year contract. $12 $12 million contract, and one of the big signings was they actually re-signed Jason Pierre-Paul to a long-term deal, four years, $62 million, which could reach $66 million, $40 million guaranteed. They signed right guard DJ Fluker to a one-year, $3 million contract, $1.5 million guaranteed, and they also re-signed right guard Jerry, John Jerry to a three-year deal. Um, don't know the dollar amount, but it's um, questionable, like, with signing two right guards, if there's going to be a shakeup in position on the O line, and 
Former New York Jets quarterback Geno Smith signed with the team for a one-year, $2 million deal. What do you think about some of these moves? I like all of them. I think the Geno Smith one, I'll, I'll start with that. I think that's good because it gives the Giants some insurance just in case something happens with Eli Manning. Now, he, Geno Smith has proven that he's not necessarily a great starting quarterback in the NFL, but he can definitely be a, a quality backup for this team, and he's still fairly young. Uh, the big move, of course, bringing back Jason Beer, Paul, no question about it. I thought that was a, a smart move. Uh, and Brandon Marshall, you know, now Eli Manning has a big target that he's been looking for for the last several seasons that he's really been missing out on. And I think that this certainly is going to add a whole other dimension to the Giants' offense. They're not done yet. They're certainly gonna, uh, there's a lot of ways that they can improve through the draft. And I think that there's no question that we're going to be talking a lot about them over the next month or so as we lead up towards the NFL draft to see what other shakeups they can do to the offense and the defense as well to improve so that they're going to be a Super Bowl contender when September comes. Yeah, I'm excited. I love the Brandon Marshall signing. That I mean, what a great talent for a relatively cheap price. And um, we got a three-headed monster. I was hoping that Martellus Bennett would come back. Um, he separated from the New England Patriots, but he got picked up by the Green Bay Packers. I thought that would have been really great because tight end is a position that needs to be filled. Um, Jason Pierre-Paul, great signing, re-signing. Love that he's back with the Giants. He's going to stay for a while. Geno Smith, uh, you know, whatever. <laughs> <laughs> he can learn under Eli Manning, and maybe by the time Eli decides to retire, since he never misses games, Geno will be ready to uh, take take the reins. Um, right guard, I don't, you know, we'll see what happens. Eric Flowers, something needs to be done because he wasn't a, almost an abomination, if not an abomination, at his position. So they will be building through the draft, and Jervis better get it right. There's still need on the O on the offensive line. So the Jets made a couple moves. They signed offensive lineman Kelvin Beecham to a three-year, $24 million contract, $12 million guaranteed. And they signed quarterback Josh McCown to a one-year, $6 million deal, fully guaranteed. Yeah, the Jets are really in a tough spot right now because... Uh, I know that going out and getting McCown gives them some stability at quarterback, but, you know, look, this is a team that's looking at a really, really rough 2017 season with all the shakeups that they've had at the quarterback position, specifically with Ryan Fitzpatrick and then with Geno Smith, and the way that just it, everything has worked out, uh, the Jets are, are, are going to be looking at a tough, tough, not only next year, but maybe the next several years if they don't fix this quick. Yeah. I mean, they just got a stop gap at the quarterback position. And maybe, you know, this might put pressure on the, the quarterback coaches to really develop Hackenberg and Bryce Petty. Because, I mean, they've been on the roster for I don't know how many years now and haven't seen much action. <laughs> Well, Keisha, despite all the excitement with March Madness, it's been kind of difficult here with the NBA in New York this past season. Of course, the Knicks have been struggling, and more bad news for the Brooklyn Nets. The word coming out of Brooklyn now is that Jeremy Lin is hurt once again. Keisha, what do you make of the Nets' struggles? Um, you know, I think this, there's a silver lining in all of this. Um, you have a first-year head coach, Kenny Atkinson, who, you know, one of his biggest things is that he's into player development. And you can see the progression of some of the players as the season goes on. So that's going to only, I only expect that to continue. So players are going to get better and better. And he's going to get better as a coach because I would imagine that uh, once the, he gets the off season, he's going to probably sit down and really evaluate himself as a coach what he's done, what he could have done differently, and he's going to have a season full of knowledge to carry with him going forward. Um, he's going to be here for, you know, at least another couple years. So I think that I believe that it's going to get better. Uh, Jeremy Lin, I think, he, I think he wants to come back before the season's end, but at this point I don't really think that it's something that has to be done. Why risk further injury? He's already had one injury that kept him out a good portion of the season, no need to run, uh, hurry back because there's no playoff berth on the line. There isn't a, a, a ring on the line. So it's probably just best that he just recuperate and be ready for next season. So I think, you know, the, Nick, the Nets will have their upswing. It's going to take a little while, but they can do it. It's got that Brooklyn grit. You know, they compete. And it's going to, it's one day is really just going to come together and it's going to be fantastic. And I'll say this when you go to Barclays Center for the net games, it's not like the place is completely empty. There are still 
you know, hardcore basketball fans there who want to see good basketball. It's just not coming the way that they want it. You're going to have to be a little bit more patient. The average text takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Welcome back to What's the 411 Sports. Well, every week we put someone on the bench for bad behavior. And when they're really behaving badly, they get in that doghouse. Keisha, you're on. Well, this week, Dallas Cowboys running back Ezekiel Elliott is on the bench. A video surfaced with Ezekiel Elliott on a parade float during St. Patrick's Day in which he pulled down a woman's top to expose her naked breast. So... No charges were filed, and Elliot's representative said later on that the woman was not upset by the gesture and actually partied with Ezekiel Elliott afterwards. This was not really what the public needed to see. Mike, tell me your thoughts on this situation. Well, bad, bad, poor choice by Ezekiel Elliott. No question about it. About it. It, it was almost as if the woman, before he wa- and he had no right to do whatever he did to this woman by pulling her top either down or up. I forget what he did, but he did expose her chest so that we could so that you could see her her breasts. Yeah. Uh, and it was a, a horribly done by Ezekiel Elliott. However, the whole time. Leading up to the incident, while he before he does that, the woman is like flaunting out her chest, and when other people would not engage that situation, Ezekiel Elliott made a horrible mistake by what he did here. Let's keep in mind this guy's had a lot of incidents over the course of the last couple of years, specifically right before he came into the NFL. So he's had some incidents before. Uh, this is not a good look, and I think he's young. So this is something that this, it's not like this is not, you know this obviously is a maturity issue, but this is certainly something that he can overcome, and it's up to him to do it now, better late than never. Yeah, this is really a bad look. Uh, there, I think there are a couple different clips of the incident floating around on the internet, and the one that I did see was that he pulled down the top to expose her breast, and then I think he reached to do maybe do it again but i saw her arm just smack Smack away away, yeah and so i was like whoa wait wait a minute and then she just went down and pulled her top (laughs) down herself so i was kind of confused by that but the fact that she swatted her hand away let me know something she was feeling a certain type of way about him being the person to do that and it just does not look good. It's not smart for Ezekiel Elliott to do this, period, because he's just very lucky that the woman was didn't press charges. So he really needs to reexamine his behavior. And maybe it's time for Jason Garrick, the Cowboys brass, to step in and, and let him know you can't keep going this way, and especially you, if you're going to continue this way, you can't be a Dallas Cowboy. The average tax takes your eyes off the road for nearly five seconds. At highway speeds, that's enough time to travel the length of a football field. Stop the texts. Stop the wrecks. Well, Mike, I'm doubly sad right now. My Duke team lost, and now we have to say goodbye to all of our friends. But don't worry. You can keep up with us until we meet again next week by friending us on Facebook, following us on Instagram and Twitter, and subscribing to our YouTube channel, all at 401 Sports TV. I'm Keisha Wilson, and on behalf of Mike McDonald, I'd like to thank you for joining us this week, and we look forward to checking you out next week.